Calais was to be held at all costs as a shield for the evacuation of the beleaguered British expeditionary force from Dunkirk. Thus it was in Calais in May 1940 that fighting in built-up areas became for the first time an inescapable factor confronting British troops hurriedly ferried across the channel to defend the town and halt the German advance. The old town of Calais grew up around the basins and docks of the harbour. A system of canals separates it from the rest of the town lying to the south. In 1940, many of Calais's centuries-old perimeter fortifications were still intact. Adjoining the old town to the west is the massive citadel, considered by many to be impregnable even in 1940. At that time, its moated ramparts protected a substantial military complex of barracks and other buildings. On the 22nd of May, as the German 2nd Armoured Division was closing in on Boulogne and the 1st Armoured Division was moving north, hurriedly embarking for Calais at Dover was the 3rd Battalion Royal Tank Regiment. We left Fording Bridge, where we'd been stationed for three months, on a train at midnight, arriving at Dover at 8 o'clock on the following morning, to be greeted at the station by some scruffy guards' soldiers who were getting out of a train on the opposite platform who asked us where we were going. And when we replied, Calais, we said, don't think much of that, mate. We've just been kicked out of Boulogne by the Germans. We also bought a copy of the Daily Mirror, which showed what the situation was in France. And when we went to the Lord Warden Hotel for briefing by the War Office representative, his briefing was exactly the same as had been in the Daily Mirror. We then embarked in one of the ferry boats, and there, on the, in the distance to the south, we could see plumes of smoke. So we knew we were in for something. Now, this was a very unexpected move, as we had been expecting to go to Cherbourg to train to join the BEF. On that same day, Wednesday the 22nd of May, the 1st Battalion, Queen Victoria's Rifles, was also landed at Calais. The QVRs were a frontline territorial motorcycle battalion. They now formed the spearhead of 30 Brigade, whose job it was to secure Calais and halt the German advance. When we left uh, Dover, we had left all our motorcycles behind, we uh, took the uh, two-inch mortars, but uh, there were no uh, mortar bombs for them. There was some smoke, I believe. There was a uh, pride of the battalion, one three-inch mortar. That never got to Calais. So uh, uh, the, um, I think I'm right in saying that uh, one-third of the battalion, uh, their weapon was only a pistol. That was the drivers of the uh, motorcycles and combinations. We had no pistol ammunition. The QVR's orders were to establish roadblocks on all routes into Calais, whilst 3RTR was to move to the southeast to secure the town of Saint-Omer. By about midday on the 23rd, half the regiment tanks were ready to roll, and we set out towards Saint-Omer, and after about seven miles, approaching a town called Geen, it was quite clear that there were a large column of enemy vehicles in front of us on the outskirts of the Forêt de Geen. In short, a fairly intensive battle took place here, uh, in which... Quite a lot of German vehicles were destroyed, but the regiment lost something of the order of 12 tanks. And it might perhaps be interesting to mention at this stage that for the A9s and 10s, which were new tanks in the headquarters, we only had practice ammunition, which we watched bouncing off the German tanks. As a result of this, the colonel decided to withdraw to a ridge to the west of Calais, at a place called Coquel. Not far away, 
guarding the road into Calais from the village of Fretin was a platoon of the Queen Victoria's Rifles commanded by Lieutenant Raymond Snowden. His position in the vicinity of the town's principal marshalling yard had enabled him to block the Fretin road with a train. On the evening of the 23rd, we consider ourselves very well placed. I had uh, my three sections nicely spaced out, and I had a, a couple of uh, Belgian machine guns, which I thought was very nice, and I had this anti-tank rifle. I had a nice roadblock, and I had another really strong roadblock of the, the, the train about half a mile behind me, and I was really pretty pleased with myself. By this time, the evening of Thursday, the 23rd of May, the dock area around the Gare Maritime was busy with the arrival of the main body of 30 Brigade under the command of Brigadier Claude Nicholson. 30 Brigade comprised the 2nd Battalion, the King's Royal Rifle Corps, the 60th, and the 1st Battalion, Rifle Brigade, together with the 1st Battalion, Queen Victoria's Rifles, already in positions on the roads leading into the town. Brigadier Nicholson's orders on arrival were to operate offensively in the direction of Boulogne. However, I think he quickly realised from reports coming in from third tanks who were deployed south of Calais and from the general sounds of battle and other intelligence that was reaching him that it was going to be beyond his uh, means, really, to carry out an offensive operation down to Boulogne. And anyway, before he did anything, the right thing was to establish a firm base in Calais. In 1940... Brigadier Grisman Davis Scorfield was a subaltern commanding a scout platoon of the 2nd Battalion KRRC, the 60th, in Calais. On the evening of their arrival, the 60th began taking up defensive positions around the western half of the old perimeter fortifications, while the Rifle Brigade covered the eastern half, including the Gare Maritime and the main dock area. By nightfall, Three RTR, severely weakened by the loss of 12 cruiser tanks at Guine earlier in the day, had withdrawn from their position on the Coquel Ridge into the town, coming under the command of Brigadier Nicholson as part of 30 Brigade. Calais by this time was a very confused place. The docks had suffered numerous Stuka attacks and the town was being shelled with increasing intensity. Despite this, throughout the day, Refugees continued to enter the town seeking food and safe shelter, both of which were becoming increasingly difficult to find. For Brigadier Nicholson, too, confusion. The ships that had brought 30 Brigade from Dover that afternoon were still being unloaded late in the evening when a telephone call was received at Brigade headquarters from the Director of Military Operations and Plans, Major General Dewing, to the effect that Brigadier Nicholson should prepare for the evacuation of Calais. A, a further complication arose in that a liaison officer arrived from headquarters British Expeditionary Force and uh, he changed all the orders and said that uh, it wasn't a question of leaving Boulogne at all, that we would hold Calais and we would open up communications between Calais and Dunkirk and in particular to get through, uh, I think it was 350,000 rations that were sitting in Calais for the BEF to get them through to Dunkirk where they could be issued to the BEF. B Squadron 3 RTR, now comprising one cruiser tank and three light tanks, was immediately ordered to secure the road to Gravelines and on to Dunkirk, ahead of the convoy of rations that was being hurriedly assembled at the docks. This convoy was formed up of uh, some 1,500 weights, and to my best recollection, it was about two to three Bren gun carriers, and a, st uh, a staff car, I think, was with it as well. And I asked one of the NCOs where we were supposed to be going, he said, oh, he said, we're going to make a, a real dash, he said, uh, to Dunkirk with rations. So I thought, well, that sounds interesting anyway. So off, off we eventually went. And we went through the deserted uh, main streets until we got out onto the outskirts. And it was then that I started you know, to, to get a bit suspicious about things as to how far away the enemy was. And one of the things that struck me was that all the streets were deserted with the exception of this priest I, we came across or we passed, who was coming along with about six rather sturdy-looking young me lads in shorts with rucksacks on their back. And I thought, well, they're pretty old chaps for a priest to be sort of in care. 
And uh, some of them had obviously had been shaving as well by the growth. And I thought after I'd passed them, I thought to myself, I bet they're fifth columnists. The convoy had barely got beyond the outskirts of the town when it encountered enemy recce units and was obliged to withdraw. Nothing further was heard of the four tanks which had gone ahead to secure the Graveline Road. And at this stage, I was sent for by the colonel and ordered to take a patrol of two light Mark 6B tanks back along the route that we had withdrawn to see if I could discover how far into the perimeter the Germans had penetrated. Now, this was interesting because, uh, as far as I'm aware, I had never been trained in this, and none of us knew anything about patrolling in built-up areas with tanks. And at this time, one must remember that they made a tremendous clatter upon the cobbles that were the surface of the roads within the towns of France. Now, the streets of Calais at that time were extremely narrow. And I was extremely surprised when passing the Hotel de Ville on the way to the Avenue Léon Gambetta to see something silver whistle past my head and hit the turret of, of the tank. I then realized, of course, that the high points in the town, like the Tower of the Hotel de Ville, the lighthouse and the old bell tower, had to be watched very carefully because they were ideal points for snipers. We pressed on one tank either side of the road until we got to the bridge which crosses the canal on the western side of the town where we came under extremely heavy machine gun fire. We replied in kind without really knowing what we were shooting at, but it seemed silly to let them get away with it all. About a mile and a half to the south of the bridge where the tank patrol came under fire, on the Freetown Road, where it runs beside the main railway line to Paris, Lieutenant Snowden and his platoon of QVRs spent a restless night manning their roadblock. Just before first light on Friday morning, the 24th of May, the platoon was stood to as it had been for most of the night. By the position, we had a signal box. I presumably it was doing all the points on the siding there. And it was a wonderful place for an OP. So I um, went up into this to see what was going on. First thing that happened was somebody had a shot at me. And when I went back to Cali in 19, 1981, the hole was still in the glass. With first light, I suppose it was about half past five, we saw coming down the road... Uh, a, a column of grey figures, which uh, we took to be um, military, and for some reason assumed that they were Dutch, because I think the Dutch uniforms are the same colour as the German ones. The last thing in our minds, I think, was that they should be Germans, which just shows how in the picture we were. However, when they came... Uh, sufficiently close, it was quite clear they were Germans, and I had that wonderful position of giving the fire orders of bushy top tree, 200 yards, single rounds fire, and we let off, everyone let off at them, and they went down, I don't know, but they disappeared, presumably, I should, we couldn't have missed them. Uh, I suppose half an hour after that, we... Um, got the order to withdraw uh, behind our uh, road bo uh, block at Les Fontinettes. And when we got uh, uh, to Les Fontinettes, uh, we understood uh, that the, all the QVR platoons had been placed under the command of the 60th and Rifle Brigade platoons, which had taken uh, uh, up their positions on the outer perimeter of the town. We took up a position on a, a, an embankment, and uh, in the distance, I saw uh, a German uh, air gun, I suppose it was, 
I was the only man in the platoon, I think, who had fired the boys' anti-tank rifle, and I did it on this occasion, deafening report. Uh, but the, the gun certainly didn't like it as it, uh, as it moved. And very shortly after that, I don't know what it was, but something went through my tin hat and I was uh, carried off to the rear. Not far away from where Lieutenant Snowden's platoon had come under fire, from his position on Bastion 9 of the perimeter fortifications, 2nd Lieutenant Davis Scorfield had a good view of the activity on his left flank that Friday morning, and by midday it was clear that an attack on his position was imminent. And my company was deployed astride the Kakel Road, both sides of it, in fairly strong natural positions. We had C Company on our right, a bit of a gap between us, but they were, they were up there between us and the sea, uh, and uh, I think it was D Company on our left, also a very large gap. These gaps had to be filled by mobile patrols, although there was a certain amount of interlocking fire organised, uh, the distances were very great. And uh, my one of my sections was employed throughout most of Friday, um, patrolling up and down, particularly between D Company and ourselves on the left, where the enemy were extremely active in the early part of the day. It's difficult, I think, to recapture in one's mind uh, that uh, really very exciting moment when the tanks came forward and one could see them manoeuvring uh, amongst the gardens and the houses and presumably uh, taking pot shots at us from behind cover there. Um, because there was a lot of artillery fire coming down, not so much on my platoon, but uh, on the, my right and behind us, where company headquarters was. And it was at this time that nearly all our soft-skinned vehicles, which had been tucked away in the streets behind, were in fact destroyed completely. Um, I know that my company commander thought that uh, uh, the, the crisis of the battle had come, and he got some reinforcements sent up, and uh, two little light tanks appeared. They bobbed up here, and they bobbed up there, and they fired. They hadn't got much more than um, a boy's rifle, except they were machine guns, 5.55, five, five, I think. And they didn't do much damage to the German tanks, but they certainly, uh, by their presence, I think, uh, caused the Germans to be even more cautious than they'd been before. My company commander had got two roadblocks across the road. They were pretty flimsy, really. They were whatever he could lay his hands on and had been put up in a great hurry. They consisted of some civilian vehicles, lorries or, or vans, uh, quite a lot of corrugated iron, um, some stones, I think, rocks, <coughs> and uh, some wire from our vehicles down at wire. But um, they were across the road and fairly flimsy, in fact, but they looked quite good. And these were covered by the two two-pounder guns, which had come up as well. But they didn't last at all uh, when the tanks came up. One German can tank, I remember, the only time one really came out into the open from behind the houses, suddenly appeared on the road, and in the space of a few seconds he'd shot both of the roadblocks to pieces. I could see now bits of these, these roadblocks jumping about into tiny fire, and I believe, understand also that they put both the two pounders out of action. The overwhelming superiority of the Germans in manpower, artillery and armour was obvious to the defenders, but difficult for the Germans to confirm while they were still probing the perimeter defences of the town. Thus, no attack was pressed home with determination throughout the almost continuous action along the entire 60th Rifles Front during the daylight hours of Friday the 24th of May. At the Gare Maritime, defended by 1st Battalion Rifle Brigade, Injured men of the BEF who had arrived by train were embarked on the ships that had brought 30 Brigade to Calais the day before. These joined the garrison personnel considered to be non-essential to the immediate defence of the town in accordance with Brigadier Nicholson's orders to prepare for the imminent evacuation of all British troops. The ships sailed during Friday morning, taking with them considerable quantities of 30 Brigade stores, vehicles and equipment which had not yet been offloaded. Even as this was happening, the Prime Minister was questioning the decision to evacuate Calais. Vice Chief of the Naval Staff informs me that an order was sent at 2 a.m. to Calais saying that evacuation was decided on in principle. But this is surely madness. The only effect of evacuating Calais would be to transfer the forces now blocking it to Dunkirk. Calais must be held for many reasons, but specially to hold the enemy on its front. During the afternoon, 
Brigadier Nicholson received orders countermanding the evacuation. Secret, stop. Personal, General Ironside to Brigadier Nicholson, stop. General Fagald appointed to command all Allied troops in North, stop. Fagald appoints you command Allied troops in Calais and forbids evacuation, stop. You will carry out this order in an active, not a passive manner, stop. Yours are all regular troops and I need not say more, stop. For the defending forces, Friday the 24th of May, their first full day in the town, had been a long and tiring one. I think our battle really began to die down in the late, uh, in the early evening. My company commander was getting a bit restive. His uh, main wireless link back to battalion headquarters had been completely destroyed uh, when the vehicles were hit. Uh, there was fires raging in the houses behind us. And uh, my company commander decided that he would go back into the town himself, contact battalion headquarters, and get some orders. At this crucial stage in the battle, with the enemy still unsure of the strength of the defending forces and the perimeter of the town firmly held by 30 Brigade, a serious breakdown in communications, both between flanking units and with Brigade headquarters, allowed rumours of a withdrawal to the docks and the evacuation of Calais to go unchecked. When the commander of B Company, 60th Rifles, Jack Poole, got back to his unit late on Friday evening, the uncertainty had not been resolved. Anyway, he said that... Um that uh, the whole situation was very uncertain, that he understood that the, both the companies on our two flanks were withdrawing, that the battalion <coughs> generally was going to take up positions further back, and he was going to withdraw, he thought, uh, in conjunction with the two companies on our flank. I think if we'd really been able to contact the commanding officer, he would have told everybody to stay put. I don't know, but anyway, we did start planning a withdrawal, and when it got dusk, uh, we started, and uh, by this time uh, there were no vehicles except in my platoon. I had six carriers left, and I was told to uh, cover the withdrawal, and back they all went on their feet, and we stayed behind until they were gone, and then we came back. As B Company pulled back from their positions astride the Coquel Road, C Company, to their right, were uncertain of their orders. Should they pull back in conformity, even though their positions had not been attacked? Second Lieutenant, later Colonel Philip Pardo, commanded C Company's scout platoon. He was given the job of finding out. However, that night, I did have my first experience of what it was like in the town when the other companies of the battalion were ordered to withdraw to the inner perimeter of the town, and I was ordered to go and make contact with the company commander on our left. It was B Company commander and to liaise with him in his new position. And that night, it made me realise how unpleasant conditions in a town can be when it's under shell fire from the enemy and under fire from sighters as well. Masonry can be falling at any time through shells landing on houses where smoke and dust uh, make visibility very bad, and where you have a problem with refugees, which uh, were flocking into Calais from the countryside, and which were blocking many of the streets. After I had made contact with um, the second command of the company on our left that night, I again realised another snag of we you know built up uh, built up areas, which is once you've got slightly lost, you can be completely lost in a built-up area. Whereas in the open, you know where, you're, where south is, you north, south, east and west, you've got your field of fire, you've got certain obvious landmarks in front of you. In the town, one street looks the same as another, if, you're, if it's strange to you, that town. And I had a bad 20 minutes when I reckoned I was completely lost. The withdrawal, in darkness through the narrow streets, with the town continuing to be bombarded by the German artillery, was a confused affair.
In the early hours of the morning, there were several Stuka raids on the docks area, and there was a huge pall of oily smoke above the docks. More buildings were burning. The streets were extremely difficult to drive through. There were telegraph wires right across the streets, buildings, piles of rubble, and uh, it was a complete shambles. I had to drive Brigadier Nicholson to the Citadel on the morning of the 25th, and he had decided that it would be better to withdraw his headquarters into the Citadel. I was very impressed with the look of the place, and I drove across a drawbridge into a large courtyard. It looked a pretty impregnable place. 30 Brigade's new defence line was now concentrated on the old town, its network of basins and canals providing a substantial obstacle to any further enemy advance. The dock area and the sand dunes beyond continued to be held by 1st Battalion Rifle Brigade, while the 60th Rifles, with the exception of C Company, holding fast on the cliffs to the west of the town, now concentrated on the defence of the bridges linking the old town to the rest of Calais. Although we were looked nice uh, on the sketches and on the maps, we were not really in very strong positions. We had none of the things that you need for defending in built-up areas, or indeed of defending any position. We had, first of all, no artillery support at all. There were two destroyers uh, off Calais, uh, certainly one and sometimes two all the time, and they were able to provide some defensive and counter-battery fire for us, but it was very inaccurate because of the, the smoke and the dust uh, over Calais, and their spotter planes that they were using, swordfish, were very, very vulnerable to the German Air Force and anyway couldn't see frankly well, and it was pretty blind shooting. It was a help. We had no artillery of our own, uh, which I'm sure to a modern soldier must seem extraordinary, really, to have a position with no defensive fire down around you at all. Uh, we had, almost worse, we had no engineer stores. We had no wire, a few strands from off which we carried on our vehicles, but nothing serious at all. No mines, no explosives with which to blow the bridges no explosives with which to make our houses and cellars and positions strong at all, and no sandbags, which, of course, are terribly important. I mean, if you want to put soldiers firing out of windows, you want to sandbag the windows, and they're very vulnerable indeed if you don't. The only thing we could do was to venture out in salties, perhaps two or three tanks together, and try and destroy targets that were bothering the riflemen. And these were mostly and tank guns and tanks. But we none of us had trained with the infantry in this role in defending built up areas. We had no means of communication with the infantry other than by screaming out of the top of the turret. They had no means of attracting our attention other than waving their arms in front of us and pointing in the direction in which we wished they wished us to fire. Second Lieutenant, later Captain Peter Fraser, commanded a platoon of the 60th Rifles manning a makeshift roadblock on one of the bridges linking Old Calais with the rest of the town. Quite early in the morning, after what would have been breakfast, a German sniper opened up from the top of the Hotel de Ville. This created a storm of machine gun fire from our machine gun posts. It's quite a natural reaction. Uh, when you're waiting under tension, increasing tension, you want to do something. Some bastard shoots at you from up the top. You do something. I was, however, dispatched very quickly by the commanding officer and to tell the post not to disclose their positions and not to waste ammunition, not to fire against, in fact, an invisible target. Then, well, things were gradually potted up after that. The, the shelling began and the mortaring began and it seemed to me that it practically never stopped until well after dark. The effect of this onslaught of fire was to set 
all that part of the old city round me set it alight. It was at midnight, I remember noticing that it was as light, if not lighter, then than it was at midday. Um, a side effect of the destruction of part of the city was a great deal of brick dust got floating about in the atmosphere. This had caused a stoppage for which we were quite unprepared in our brand guns because brick dust got into the piston block and they had to be, they had to be taken out and stripped and cleaned. I, we were, being in a city, in just there a cafe, because I found myself a pat of butter with which I was cleaning the piston block when a kindly sergeant, with that look of utter contempt that the sergeant has for a young officer trying to do something with a weapon, in particular in come taking it to pieces, said, give me that, sir. That saved my life, because we, I changed places with him. I found myself behind a wheel of a truck, and the poor sergeant was between, so to speak, the wheels. And uh, uh, snipers started very effectively. And one of them, by just firing under the truck from two or three hundred yards away, I suppose, killed the sergeant. In fact, they killed the 19 of us who manned that barricade. Three of us lived, one losing sight of one eye and being shot through the arm. I uh, was told by the, the sergeant to take up a position on the, the side of the canal behind a bollard there with, with my direction of fire over towards the streets that led down from the town to the quayside and the station. And it was whilst we were there during the day that the Marines came ashore with the, with the purpose of blowing up the little iron bridge that connected the, the station with the main part of the town. By this time, there were a hell of a lot of refugees had gathered and there were a motley crowd. There was women and children and old men, but amongst them was obviously people that that were odd bods they were because they they were able-bodied and pretty well fit-looking. And the company commanders gave the order to our chaps on the other side of the bridge not to let these people come across. And there was a lot of arguing and shouting and, and the women were screaming. And eventually, uh, our company commander had now taken over second-in-command, oh, he'd taken over command of the, of the troops. Uh, in Cali, uh, gave the order to blow the bridge. The Germans maintained their remorseless mortar and artillery bombardment throughout the morning of Saturday the 25th of May. From his new headquarters within the moated ramparts of the Citadel, Brigadier Nicholson could have little doubt that without substantial reinforcements, without any artillery support whatsoever, without fresh water, which had all but disappeared, the ability of 30 Brigade to continue its defence of the town could now be numbered not in days, but hours. At midday, the bombardment ceased as enemy aircraft flew low overhead, dropping leaflets demanding that the garrison surrender or be bombed out. At the same time, German envoys were sent under a white flag to the citadel bearing the same surrender demand. Brigadier Nicholson's reply is recorded in the war diary of the German 10th Armoured Division. The answer is no, as it is the British Army's duty to fight, as well as it is the Germans. The bombardment of the old town was resumed with unparalleled ferocity. Shortly before all radio and telephone communications were destroyed, Brigadier Nicholson received this message from the War Office, dictated by the Prime Minister. Defence of Calais to the utmost is of highest importance to our country as symbolising our continued cooperation with France. The eyes of the Empire are upon the defence of Calais and His Majesty's Government confident you and your gallant regiments will perform an exploit worthy of the British name. Saturday the 25th of May ended much as it had begun. The inner defensive line held firm despite continuous artillery and mortar bombardment the Germans all the time consolidating their hold on the remainder of the town. With first light on Sunday, the Stukas returned. I heard the noise of aircraft in the air, and being an optimist, I said, hooray, the Royal Air Force are coming. 
Then I saw 54 aircraft flying in three groups of 18. They were German dive bombers, as we soon discovered. They broke up into, into wings of flights of three, and one flight took on by bridge. After the Stukas, the mortaring again began in earnest. And at one point, uh, I saw a mortar shell burst about 30 yards in front of me. A minute later, another mortar shell burst about 30 yards behind me. I pointed out to a senior officer, Major called Godfrey Cromwell, that it, the odds were that in about 55 seconds, it would land, the next one would land on him and me. And if we retreated 50 yards, we could cover the bridge still. So he agreed. We retreated 50 yards, bringing back the few who were alive that we had with us. There, to our horror, we found ourselves enfiladed by a German tank, which had succeeded in knocking out the garrison of the bridge on our right and crossing it, the first of many German tanks. To me, I think the most unpleasant aspects of fighting in the town were... Firstly, the effect of shell fire landing on buildings, which instead of, as in the open country, a crump and a shell lands, and that's it, it involves masonry coming tumbling down, sh um, slates falling off roofs, dust in the streets, smoke everywhere, houses on fire, um, and this blinds you from other members of your section, your platoon, and in any case, in the town, it's very easy to get quickly disorientated. There was a mass of refugees pouring one way and the other, like, really like a sort of flock of sheep, not knowing where to go to escape from the Germans. And, of course, completely blocking that one's field of fire. The positions that 30 Brigade held on to so tenaciously throughout Friday and Saturday had, on Sunday morning, begun to give way. C Company's 60th Rifles had finally been driven from their long-held positions on the cliffs, and as they fell back toward the docks, German troops were consolidating footholds gained in the old town under cover of their advancing tanks. The last message to reach the beleaguered citadel was landed by boat from one of the minesweepers patrolling the waters just a few hundred yards from the beaches of Calais. Every hour you continue to exist is of greatest help to the BEF. Government has therefore decided you must continue to fight. Have the greatest possible admiration for your splendid stand. The splendid stand was, however, all but over. By midday on Sunday, the 26th of May, Brigade headquarters could no longer coordinate the defence. Around the Gare Maritime, the Rifle Brigade fought on in an increasingly desperate rearguard action. While in the Old Town, companies of the 60th Rifles held out in isolation. Second Lieutenant Davis Scorfield was at this time acting second in command of B Company, occupying houses in the vicinity of the Place de Norvège. When I got back into company headquarters, I found that a lot of casualties had been carried in there and uh, there were people saying that the Germans were right round us. And my company commander, I suppose by this time it must have been uh, into the afternoon, my company commander, again, was a very stalwart person. He'd uh, been in the first war, he'd got a DSO and an OB and an MC and uh, highly decorated and very brave chap. He said, uh, you stay here and take command of the company, I must find out what's happening because we're out of touch with everybody. And uh, we all tried to persuade him not to go, and we, some of us offered to go instead, you know. But you no, know, he said, it's my job to go, and you stay here. And he hadn't been gone very long when um, we suddenly found that uh, we started seeing Germans in the streets. Um, in fact, what had happened was the Germans had overrun the companies in the centre. And the commanding officer had decided that further resistance was impossible and he had done his level best to get around and tell people to pack it in and to break up into small parties and to try and make one's way through the lines. Uh, they were very good, clever uh, and capable, the Germans. They went from crossroads to crossroads and established themselves at each crossroads, put down machine guns and, uh, and so on and so forth. 
the final moments of the battle for Calais were fought close by the quays of the Gare Maritime, where the men of 30 Brigade had landed, most of them, just three days before, and from where now all seaworthy craft, large and small, had departed. There were a few, very few, who managed to escape. But for the rest of 30 Brigade who survived, five long years in German prisoner of war camps lay ahead. A significant factor at Calais, as in all Fibua actions, was the density of buildings, especially in the narrow streets of the old town. Whilst imposing limited observation on both sides, the buildings made the German commanders overcautious, because they were unable to assess the true strength of the defending forces. However, fighting in built-up areas also imposes disadvantages on the defender, which were very apparent in Calais. The difficulty of passing orders frequently led to confusion and rumour. Short fields of fire made it difficult to provide effective mutual support in the final stages of the battle. Incendiarism, one burning building rapidly spreading the fire to others, forced evacuation of strong points. Civilians, and especially refugees, posed difficult problems of control and enabled infiltration by enemy snipers and fifth columnists. The defence of Calais not only helped to delay the German advance long enough to allow the evacuation of the British expeditionary force from Dunkirk at the beginning of June 1940, but also led to a new awareness of the need for thorough training in the techniques of fighting in built-up areas. <laughs> 